All right. So welcome to Jump Starting the Growing Season. Um, I'm Dean Gunderson, the Director of Education here at Seed St. Louis. Um, and we will get going. Uh, so if you're not familiar with who Seed St. Louis is, so you know, like why we're giving this presentation. Um, so we are a support organization whose purpose is to provide the community with the education resources and a network to grow their own food. So um, what we're kind of most known for is we work with community gardens, school gardens, and community and school orchards. Uh, that number is actually a little old. Uh, we currently support a little over 250 projects across uh, the St. Louis area. Uh, and this is a little bit outdated map of where those projects are. Uh, we currently provide one-on-one -on -one staff consultation, volunteers, a tool loan program, and access to garden and orchard supplies to those network projects. Um, and then we also have um, uh, other things that we do that were designed to help those network projects, but that are also open to the general public because it wasn't really any extra work for us to make it open to the general public. And we thought that it could be useful to people. Um, so we also sell low cost seeds, organic garden and orchard supplies, um, specially selected vegetable seedlings that we contract grow with um, the community college and a local grower, depending on the season. Uh, we run a demonstration garden, which is unfortunately closed this year. Um, we teach classes, which is what we're doing tonight. Um, and we have an annual conference that is accessible to, to anyone. And that conference is actually next weekend. Um, the in-person is booked up, but if you're interested in watching it virtually, a lot of the classes will be available virtually. Um, and we actually do not have a backyard gardener program this year. It's on pause. Um, but we will at some point have a backyard gardener program again. So what we're here to talk about tonight, uh, getting a jump start on the season. Um, so why would you want to do that? Um, so the there's there's several reasons why having that kind of earlier start, um, could be beneficial. One, it can allow earlier harvests from your garden. So, you know, if you get stuff started earlier, usually they're going to mature earlier, which means you can harvest them earlier. Um, this also means that you can eat from your garden for a longer period of time. If you can start eating from your garden earlier in the year, then you have more months out of the year that you can be growing your own local fresh food. Um, and it can allow you to grow things that you might not otherwise be able to grow with our length of season. There's some things that do fine in our weather, but we just don't have a long enough warm period um, for them to really get to full size. Ginger is a classic example of this, which we'll talk about kind of at the end of the class. Um, and there's several different ways to get a jump start on the season. The first couple ones I'm going to talk about are probably not what you thought we would mostly be talking about, but are really the best ways to get a jump start on the season. So we're going to go through those first, and then we're going to go through um, how to get, you know, like the conventional things that you probably think about started earlier. So by far the easiest way to have an early crop and the way that people used to get early crops for many thousands of years um, before there was plastic to create. Uh, greenhouses and whatnot, um, was plant perennials. That's why perennial vegetables exist for the most part, is because they ripen earlier. Like that's why people dedicated the space and took the time to domesticate these perennials, which usually have much lower yields. They did it because they could get food earlier in the year than you can with annuals. Just full stop. It's like they just, they produce earlier. Um, <clears throat> There are lots of different perennial vegetables out there. Um, if you dive into like permaculture reading at all, you'll find all sorts of ones listed. And personally, I think a lot of those are garbage. They are, um, I mean, they, they grow fine, they produce fine, but the flavor is just not to the liking of the like average Midwestern American palate. Um, there are, you know, places in the world where some of those things might be desirable, but a lot of the, the perennial vegetables tend to be um, tougher than Americans usually like. They tend to be more bitter than most <laughs> native born Americans like, um, or really sour. Uh, but this list here are ones that, um, that are a little bit more analogous to things that are commonly eaten um, and, and also do well here. So asparagus, you know, a lot of people already love asparagus. It's a great, great perennial vegetable, produces really pretty well. Um, walking onions are a nice perennial onion. It's basically a green a green onion um, that's that's perennial and starts greening up like 
like now, like in the next week or two, it'll start sending up shoots. Um, sea kale is one that is similar to broccoli. Um, it is a little bitter for some people's tastes, but um, if you cook it with some like vinegar or something like that, um, it, it, it's really good. Um, it is very similar to broccoli. Mitsuba, um, and that's what this picture is here on the left, is a green that will actually grow in the shade and as a perennial. And it has a, a flavor kind of similar to parsley. It's not identical, but it's a similar-ish flavor. You can use it in similar ways as you would parsley. Uh, rhubarb is kind of the only other perennial vegetable that most Americans have heard of or have eaten. Um, that one's a little bit trickier to grow here just because it really likes colder climates. It's really um, happier further north of here, but it can be grown here as long as you have really good drainage. Um, it does not like wet or overly heavy soils, especially in the winter. Uh, another one is Scorzonera, which is actually most commonly grown as an annual root crop. It gets a big, long kind of carrot looking root um, that is pretty good to eat. But if you don't pull that root out of the ground and eat it, um, and you just leave it in the ground, it is perennial here. And the leaves of Scorzonera are actually pretty good. They're pretty mild um, compared to most perennial vegetables, which again, tend to be more bitter or tough. Um, they're pretty mild. That's what this picture is here on the right. They have these kind of long, um, skinny leaves. This is not the plantain that you see growing as a weed, although it looks kind of similar. Uh, but these long leaves are edible and 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 pretty mild. Like I've even used them as like a salad base, like instead of lettuce, and they and they're still pretty good for that. Sorrel is another one um, that does have um, some. Can't think of the right word for it. Kind of zesty, citrusy, sour kind of notes to it. Um, so definitely not like a salad base, but um, you know, it's kind of like a flavoring to things. It's pretty good. Uh, horseradish is a perennial vegetable, does really well here. In fact, Collinsville produces 65% of the world's horseradish. Um, so it really likes St. Louis's climate. Um, and you can harvest the roots, but you can also eat the leaves. And the leaves in very early spring uh, are very tender and they have kind of a mild horseradishy flavor. They're really good, kind of chopped up and thrown into salads or into dishes or used as a seasoning anywhere that you would use horseradish roots. Um, the greens work work just as well. Uh, when the leaves get really big, they're still edible, but they get much spicier and much more tough. But when they're young, um, very tender and, and very good. Wild arugula is another one that it's it's just the like undomesticated form of arugula. So it tastes exactly like arugula, except it is it is more, more spicy. It, it definitely has more heat to it um, and it's a little bit tougher. So what I actually really like to do with this is to just like um, very lightly cook them because they're thicker, they hold up to cooking in a way that annual arugula really doesn't. You know, annual arugula, if you cook it, it just kind of turns into mush. Um, the, the wild arugula holds up much better. Um, and if you cook it, it basically brings it down to kind of the same spiciness as annual arugula. So, um, and then wild violets, like the violets that just like grow in lawns um, are edible and pretty dang good. Uh, the African violets that like people grow in pots, not edible and not a violet. Um, so don't eat those. Um, but like the wild ones that grow outside, like as a weed in your yard is um, very mild and very tender. It's nice, the green and the leaves are both edible, or sorry, the, the flower and the leaves are both edible. And then herbs, you know, chives, garlic chives, sage, oregano, thyme, all those perennial herbs um, will start producing uh, really early in the spring. And, are, and all of those are just a great way to get earlier food from your garden. You can also overwinter crops, which is something that, you know, too late to do for this year, but um, you could plan to plant them this fall to have earlier harvest next spring. Um, and this is one of the areas that I have been doing the most expansion in my garden is overwintering crops um, because I don't like the heat of summer. It's not fun to be in the garden when it's a hundred degrees outside. And overwintering crops, you're doing a lot of your work when it's much cooler. So some of the ones that will naturally overwinter so when I say that, I mean, you, you don't need to be providing extra um, protection of any kind. You can just plant them in the ground, you know, leave them uncovered and they will be fine. 
Um, so that list is is a lot of um, of alliums, a lot of stuff in the onion family. So garlic, shallots, elephant garlic, um, potato onions, which are a type of onion that um, gets a bulb. The bulbs are not overly big. They're you know about yay big. But when you, you plant one and then when you dig it up, it's a clump. So then you break off all of them and you eat all of them except one, which you can plant again to continue kind of multiplying the, the onions. Uh, walking onions, which we talked about a little bit already, they're a, um, they're a true perennial. So you can just leave them in the ground and harvest whenever you want. But planting them in the fall is my favorite time to do it. I usually plant them kind of um, when it cools down in the fall, and then I'm eating some of them in the fall, but mostly the best ones are if you plant in the fall, then that next spring, they're a nice big size, and then I'm eating them like end of February, into March, like I, and I just like eat all the green onions, just so many green onions at the beginning of the season, because they're just so easy to overwinter if you do walking onions. Um, fava beans, which are not super common in the, in the States, but um, it's a, it's a, bean. It's a type of legume. Um, most of them will not overwinter here, but I've had pretty good luck with the variety Sweet Loran. Um, it doesn't always overwinter, or at least not a hundred percent of them will overwinter. Um, but if you plant them, at least some of them will overwinter. And then if you save those seeds and plant again, a higher percentage will overwinter. You can kind of breed your own cold hardy variety. Uh, there are winter peas. So these are, these are grain peas, um, but you can eat the greens, like the leaves are edible. Um, you can eat the immature peas, although they're not overly sweet, or you can let them ripen all the way and have like peas, like dried peas for like split pea soup or something like that. Uh, the varieties that I've had luck with doing that are Austrian peas, lynx pea, and blaze pea. Uh, if you like lentils, you can also grow lentils as an overwintering crop. Uh, Morton lentil is the, is the variety that I've had luck with doing that. Not, not all of them will overwinter. Most of them will not, but Morton does. Uh, you can also grow winter wheat, winter rye, winter barley, um, any winter forms of the ancient wheats. So things like emmer, einkorn, um, there, there is winter emmer, there's winter einkorn, um, and those are all just older forms of wheat. Um, and then there, I've had some luck if you want to be experimental. Um, there are some oats that will overwinter to some degree, and there are some chickpeas that will overwinter to some degree. So especially if you have kind of a warmer microclimate, they will probably overwinter for you. Um, there's also overwintering crops that uh, are bred to overwinter, like that they will overwinter just fine. Um, but in our climate, they usually need a little bit of protection. So um, they are, I, I recommend all of these that you at least have the option of covering them in some way. And we'll talk about um, ways to cover things. But these are not ones that I would recommend just sticking in the ground and hoping for the best um, if you really want to get a crop. Um, you might get lucky. It might be a mild enough winter that they'll overwinter without cover. But if you want to know that you're going to get overwintering crops, these are ones that you really need to at least have the option to cover if it gets really cold. Um, so these would be things like sprouting broccoli. So this is a broccoli that produces pretty loose heads, but produces a lot of small loose heads um, that you plant in the fall around the time that you're planting fall broccoli. Um, but instead of getting, instead of producing a head in the fall, it just produces a giant plant. And then in um, kind of early spring, early to mid spring, like April-ish time, it'll start producing little broccoli heads. Winter cauliflower is probably the best way to grow cauliflower here. Uh, the three varieties that I've had luck with are Corella, Chester, and Fredor. Um, so these are ones that, again, you would be planting in the fall around the time that you would be planting um, cauliflower for a fall harvest, but it won't produce cauliflower that fall. It'll just produce a really big plant. It'll overwinter. And then about the end of April, early May, it'll produce um, the heads of cauliflower and they're and they're pretty nice heads. This is a picture of one of them that we let go a little long. You can see it's a little kind of fuzzy on there, um, but there's other ones that we like harvested at the right time and they look like perfect grocery store cauliflower. Uh, and the reason that I put three varieties on here is that um, all three of these did well, but they all produced at a slightly different time. So we when we planted all three of these, we were getting cauliflower for about a month, um, kind of staggered throughout the time. There's also varieties of cabbage that are called winter cabbage. So these are ones that are designed to, if you have them covered, 
that they will just kind of hold in the garden and you can harvest them anytime from when you would normally harvest a cabbage in the fall all the way until spring. Um, when when it warms up in spring, it'll bolt and start to produce seeds, which at which point you can't really eat it. But anytime between, you know, November through, you know, March-ish time frame, you can you can harvest that. And it's just kind of sitting there in the garden waiting for you to eat it. Kale and collards, most of them will overwinter if you give them some protection. Uh, there's some winter kohlrabi, which is similar to the winter cabbage, in that it, um, it, it produces in the fall, but then it will hold in the garden. It'll just kind of stay good as long as you um, give it some protection all winter long. Um, it's been a little hit or miss, but we've had some luck with doing um, Brussels sprouts as an overwintering crop, like where you plant them in the fall, you provide them protection, and then in the, the late spring, they produce Brussels sprouts, um, which is much easier to do than trying to plant Brussels sprouts in the spring and getting them in the summer when it's really too hot for them. Uh, turnip greens, spinach, and carrots also all will overwinter just fine if you if you give them some protection. Another way to get a jump start uh, in your garden or to get food earlier is to wild harvest some some food. Um, you know, you can turn weeding into harvesting. There's a lot of those those winter weeds in the garden. Um, things like chickweed, uh, the wild, wild violets, uh, garlic mustard, wild onions, garlic, dead nettle, henbit, those are all edible. Um, dead nettle and henbit, I don't love the taste of, but they are edible. But the other ones, uh, you know, the chickweed, wild violet, garlic mustard, wild onions, wild garlic, are all pretty good. Um, and they're edible. And if you're ripping them out anyways, why not eat them? There's also several crops that were even started as as weeds just to show you that you know like eating weeds may seem kind of weird but um mosh is is a is not really popular here in the states but is a really popular winter vegetable in um in france in particular um and other parts of of western europe but in particular in france um and it and it it was a weed it it was also called corn salad which sounds like a really weird uh phrase to americans but um, corn, um, you know, in, in old English, just meant grain. Like the word that we use for grain, that's what corn used to mean. Um, which is why, like, if you go and you read, like, old English texts from before Europeans came to the New World, um, they'll be talking about corn. And you're like, they didn't have corn. Corn was from Mexico. And it's because corn used to just mean grain. And then when, they, and then when you know, people came to uh, North America from Europe, uh, what we call corn, or maize um, was the grain, like it was the most important grain. So corn and grain kind of like, like, it, like it like merged meanings. So this, this used to just mean the salad, like the leafy thing that you get from the grain because it grew in grain fields as a weed, but it's now a crop. It's like a crop that's like intentionally planted and grown. And actually oats, believe it or not, started out as a weed in wheat and barley fields until you know, several thousand years ago. Um, it was domesticated actually on a completely different continent than oats are originally from. Um, <clears throat> so there are many more edibles that grow wild in the spring, um, just not necessarily in the garden. Like there's lots of other foraging things that you can do. There's lots of food out there in the spring if you want, but that's, that's like a whole other topic. Um, so in terms of things that you can actually start early, like probably what most of you were thinking about when you signed up for this class. There are some things that are just really early seeding crops. Um, so early March is usually the earliest that most crops can be planted in St. Louis without some kind of modification. But there are some less common crops that can be planted earlier. Um, and by earlier, it means really as early as the soil can be worked. Um, you know, February is hard just because even if it's warm, usually the soil is too is too wet to really do anything. But if you get a dry spell before March, you can plant oats, um, flax, or bread seed poppy, all of which grow fine here. Um, these are bread seed poppy. They're very pretty. It's where poppy seeds come from. Um, and then flax, you can grow flax seed. Or if you're into fiber art, you can, you know, make some linen or something. Um, and then oats, obviously, you get oats from. But most of you are probably not wanting to grow grains. 
Um, so there are some early seeding crops that are a little more conventionally vegetables um, in that in the way that most people would would probably recognize um, a garden crop. Uh, but most of them are are lesser known. So fava beans, which we mentioned a little earlier, you can overwinter, but usually um, you would plant them just very early spring um, in, in our climate. So you can do fava beans. Um, walking onions, you know, I've mentioned as a perennial, a fall planted. You can also plant them in the spring. They're, they're just, they're very, very adaptable plants. Same with potato onions. Uh, you usually get higher yields on potato onions if you plant them in the fall, but you can plant them in the spring as well, very early spring. Um, mosh, which we talked about already, that's this uh, this here on the left. It's just a little leafy thing you can plant really early. And another plant called Claytonia, which is this here on the right, which looks similar to chickweed, but it's, it's not. The leaves are a little bigger. Um, and then arugula, which is one that most of us have probably heard of. Um, arugula can also be planted early. And so these can all really be planted whenever the soil temperature is at least um, 40 degrees, which is pretty cold. Most of the other stuff wants kind of at least 45 to 50. So if you get up to like 40 degree soil temperature, which is usually sometime in, in February, you can, you can plant those as long as the soil is dry enough that you can actually like work the soil to get the seeds planted, which is usually the real trick of getting stuff planted too early. Um, so yeah, so growing commonly grown uh, spring crops earlier than normal. So like if you're like, well, I want to start my broccoli earlier, I want to start my carrots early or something like that. Um, in order to do that, what, what that generally requires is creating a warmer microclimate. It's doing something to make the, the garden bed or the, the row or wherever you want to plant those things warmer than it would be if it was just doing its own thing, if you were just waiting for the weather to warm up the soil for you. So like I said, you need to heat the soil above 40 degrees um, as, as like the minimum. Like if the soil is not 40 degrees, there really isn't anything that you should be planting. Um, once you get to 40 degrees is when you can start planting those, those cool season plants. Most of them, other than the ones that we talked about in the last slide, really want it a little warmer than 40 degrees. Um, and, the, and the higher above 40 degrees you go, kind of the faster the germination is going to happen. Um, and, and so again, for other than those things that we just talked about in the last slide, most of the other things you want to get to at least 45, really kind of more 50 would be would be a good a good soil temperature. And there's several ways to do this. You can use low tunnels, you can use cold frames, which are also sometimes called mini greenhouses. You can use cloches, which is really what we should call mini greenhouses. Um, or you can just use sheet plastic. Um, and if you use these techniques, it can allow you to plant things four to six weeks earlier than normal. So low tunnels um, are just these like little kind of short row kind of greenhouse looking things. So it is where you have low hoops. So the hoops are the kind of the, the round frame here with a fabric or plastic cover of some kind to act like a small greenhouse. Um, so to make the hoop, you can use several different things to make the hoops. Um, a heavy gauge wire can be something. So like thick wire that you kind of bend um, into a hoop is one option. They also sell pre-bent ones that you can buy online or we sell them um, uh, on our website and you can come and pick them up from our office. Um, and you can also use half inch PVC pipe, which is what this, this picture is here. Um, so all of those things bend pretty well and you just kind of stick them in the ground um, and, they, and they work. And then you can cover it either with row cover, which is also called frost blanket some, sometimes. So it's kind of a spun material that looks kind of like a dryer sheet is what row cover is, but it comes in, you know, big, long rolls of fabric. You can also use plastic, like clear sheet plastic, um, and they make um, plastic for low tunnels that is perforated. That's a weird way to spell it. Pre-perforated. Pre um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that's right. Uh, anyways, uh, so pre-perforated. So they have like little kind of cuts in the plastic. So what that does is it helps um, prevent overheating in in the low tunnel, which we're going to talk about talk about that. <clears throat> but you can just use like solid plastic. It's just a little bit more work than getting the the stuff that's pre-cut. And again, you can buy that online. We also sell the the pre-cut um, uh, or pre-perforated plastic. Um, 
on our website that then you can come and pick up if you're not able to find it somewhere else. <clears throat> uh, da, da, da. So constructing a low tunnel is very easy. Um, all you need to do is push the hoops, whatever material you're choosing to use. Um, this one here was actually using uh, something I didn't talk about. You can also use like metal conduit that then you bend, um, which is just a little heavier duty than like just a, a metal wire. So you just uh, bend it, push it into the soil, or you can do kind of what these people did. You can build like a frame on it and then move the whole thing and like stick it on a, on a raised bed if you want, but it's usually easier to have them separated for, for storage purposes. Uh, and then, and yeah, when you're making your hoops, you want to make sure to cut them so that there is excess um, at the, or sorry, not the hoops, <laughs> um, for the fabric. When you want to make sure that there is excess at the end, because if your fabric, if you make the hoops so that your fabric comes down and just touches like the soil surface at that, it's going to be really hard to keep that fabric on or that plastic on. You need to secure it somehow. And usually the best way to do that is to have extra excess at the end that you either put bricks along or you use big sod staples, which are kind of big metal kind of staple looking things that you push into the fabric or the plastic to literally like staple it down to the ground. Um, Cause if you don't do that, you get a wind that comes it just blows it off. So you wanna make sure that whatever size, um, hoops you're making, whatever sort like length of tunnel and everything, that you have enough um, cover material to have excess at the ends to either put bricks or rocks or something to weigh it down or staples um, to push through the edges to secure it. And then venting. So this is really important with all of the techniques that we're going to talk about today. Um, so after plants germinate, um, you have to be careful that it doesn't get too hot in there, which you might not think you're like, oh, it's like it's cold outside. It's not going to get too hot, but it does. You know, it's the same idea of, you know, it can be pretty cold outside, but if it's a really sunny day and you're in your car, it's it's a lot warmer, even without the, the heat on, if you sit in there for a while. Um, and if you're in, you know, if you're in this like tunnel, which is like all glass, it can get, it can get surprisingly warm, um, even if it's very cold outside, inside those things. And the problem is, especially as you get later into the season, so like right now, it's not going to be as big of a problem, but as you get like more toward the end of February or even into March, um, where it's just a little bit warmer and we have more sunny days and the days are longer, uh, you can actually get it so warm in there that it, that it, can, it can scorch the plants, it can, it can injure the plants, um, or even if it doesn't do that, the, the big temperature swings that that will cause because as soon as the sun goes down, it's going to cool down pretty quickly. Um, when you get that really warm, the plant is then thinking, oh, it's going to be warmer. And then when you get that drop at night, it, it can actually be more stressful to the plant than if it was just uncovered. Um, when you get into the warmer times of the, you know, in, in the next month or so. So if you're using a row cover, or especially if you're using non-perforated plastic, you're going to need some way to vent it. You're going to need to go out there on days that are sunny or particularly warm, and you're going to need to open it. Like you can just open up the end, you know, take the bricks off, kind of fold it up, um, which I think I had, a, which I had a picture of a couple slides ago, um, where you kind of like take the plastic off or partially take it off. Um, so it doesn't get overly hot in there. And that's really important. If you have the pre-perforated plastic um, and, and row cover to some degree, you don't need to worry about that as much until, again, you get later into the season when it's like really warm. You know, we've got days that are 70 degrees outside and sunny. You're, you're probably going to want to vent every, like no matter what material you have. But even I think Saturday, it's supposed to be like close to 60 degrees or something like that. Um, so like if you had stuff covered, you should be venting that on Saturday, um, at least by like midday, like when it's like the really hot part of the day, because um, it can get really hot in those. Uh, cold frames are another thing you can do. So cold frames are, you know, similar idea. They're all kind of the same idea, um, except instead of having like hoops with plastic over the top, you have some sort of solid walls. So whether that's wood or, you know, I've seen people where they'll like stack up um, straw bales or bricks or whatever you want to do. There's like some sort of solid wall and then there's a translucent top. So that's usually either glass, like you can use old glass windows or it's a rigid plastic. So you can see this is like, you know, the 
um, this is like a greenhouse type plastic, or this is just like a piece of acrylic that you can get at the hardware store. And it just acts as, again, a small greenhouse. So these um, can stay a little bit warmer than the, the low tunnels, simply because they're, the, the materials are more solid. There tends to be less airflow. Um, and so they stay a little warmer, but they can also overheat a little bit more because they, because they stay warmer. So you will again need to vent these on hot days. And this can be done manually by like just opening up the top, you know, just taking some of these windows off or like this, usually there's a hinge on the back side of this and just like flipping it open or opening it partially way, partial um, and wedging like a, a piece of wood or something like that in it to, to keep it from overheating, to keep some airflow in there. They also, especially if you have kind of a bigger one or you want to do a lot or, you know, you just want to spend the money to do it. They also make these, these vent arms that are pretty cool. <laughs> they are, they're, um, they're manual, so they don't need any electrical at all, um, but they will automatically open and close depending on the temperature. And they do that because this black cylinder here is filled with a, a specially formulated wax that um, below, and I can't remember the exact temperatures, and you, and you can adjust it like by, you can like screw this tighter or looser, and depending on how tight or loose it is, um, as, it, as it warms up, that wax will melt, and as it melts, it expands, and it will push the arm open. Um, and then at night, when it starts cooling down, that wax will resolidify and it will slowly close until the, the, the lid is closed again. And you can kind of adjust, again, you can like um, tighten or loosen that cylinder and the tighter it is, um, the faster it'll open, like the lower temperature it'll open. And the more you loosen it, the hotter it will need to get before it will open. Um, but those are pretty cool. Um, but they, you know, if you're wanting to do, you know, more than a couple, uh, cold frames that can get pretty pricey. They, they tend to be like 40 bucks a piece, like 25 to 40 bucks a piece. And so, you know, if you're wanting to do several cold frames that can get, that can get pretty expensive, but they are um, a pretty cool way to kind of automatically do that for you. Uh, cloches are probably the simplest, cheapest way um, to, to get an early season on, um, or to, to get a jump start on your, your early season crops. So cloches are, are, I guess what you would call micro greenhouses. You know, if, um, if cold frames are mini greenhouses, then these are micro greenhouses. So these are, are con containers that you are using to cover individual plants. Uh, cloches were, or at least the, the style that we use in, in the US was derived from um, the French tradition of, of doing this. Um, for market gardening. It was a way to, to get crops earlier in the spring to the, the big Parisian markets. Um, they The traditional ones were really large bell-shaped glass vessels. Um, some of them were terracotta for, for more specialized use, but mostly they were big glass bell-shaped things. So pretty pricey. Um, and you had to manually put them on and take them off every day, uh, which is a lot of work. <clears throat> what people have started using now, which is much cheaper and is less work, is old plastic bottles. So particularly old milk jugs is, is one that is really popular because they're, they're nice and big. And what you do is whatever size bottle you have, you cut the bottom of it off and then you can you know plant a seedling or you can plant a seed. And then you stick this over and it will warm just that little place. So especially at this time of year, when you're planting things and they're really small, you know, covering the whole big bed for a bunch of little itty bitty plants um, isn't really necessary. So you can do this where you're just covering individual plants um, and it can be a way to do that. And the other thing that's nice about these bottles is that, you know, early in the season when it's, when it's pretty consistently cool, you know, you can just leave the lid on, leave it covered, it's fine. But as you start, as it starts warming up and you need to vent them, you can just take the lid off and then you can just leave the lid off. And that's usually enough venting um, until it starts getting really warm, at which point you usually probably don't need them anymore. So that can be a really nice way to warm up a little, a little spot or to keep, you know, one individual seedling um, warm. They also sell these little cheap cloches 
um, that you can buy. They're not overly expensive, but I think probably most of us can find some some old plastic bottles for free instead of buying new plastic. <clears throat> um, and like I said, they work great for seedlings. You can also just use plastic, like if you're wanting to just warm up like a whole area um, so that your things will, will germinate faster or warm it up um, so that when you plant, you know, you can plant maybe, you know, a week early or something like this. Um, but, and, and you would want either a, a clear plastic or a black plastic um, are usually the ones that are gonna um, warm it up the fastest. And you just cover the soil, you know, you need to weigh it down with something. Uh, you can, again, use sod staples or bricks, rocks, whatever you got. Um, the main problem with this one is it it's not very feasible for this to be used as a way to really get a big jump start on the season because to plant things, you then need to take the plastic off and then the soil is, is cooling off again. So again, it can be a way to kind of, um, kind of preheat the soil if you're just wanting to start stuff like a week early or maybe two weeks early. But if you're wanting to start stuff, you know, more than two weeks early, you know, covering this and then taking it off and planting seeds, the soil is going to cool off again because the air temperature is so cool. So, so this is really more of like a short term, short term thing to just get like a faster germination um, on things that you're just wanting to start, you know, a little early. So then how, how does this work? You know, how, like, what is this, what does this actually look like? You know, all these different things, like, like how could these kind of work together? So you want to heat up the soil before you plant. So that's, so that can be really helpful um, because again, you need that soil to be at a certain temperature to germinate. So if you plant things and the soil is, you know, 33 degrees, like, you know, just thawed or something, and then you put a cover over it to warm it up, that's probably going to work. But your seeds are then going to sit there and they're going to be very slow to germinate um, because the soil is going to be too cold for them to germinate. And then it's going to warm up and it's going to, it's going to take a while to warm it up. So they're going to, they're going to germinate really slowly. And there's a chance that especially if we have overcast days, it's not warming up particularly fast, that the seeds might not germinate. They might just rot. Um, so you really want to warm up the soil first. So if you, you know, so you could cover the soil with plastic or you could put the cold frame up, put the low tunnel up. Um, you could put the clo you know put the cloches out if you want to kind of pre-warm the soil and then once it's been up for you know I don't know a couple days a week you know depending on you know how sunny it's been then plant stuff into it and then leave that thing over it <clears throat> and um, and yeah like we talked about with the sheet plastic um, for an earlier planting then like the sheet plastic you will want to heat up the soil and then plant things into into an environment that's still covered. So, so, you know, like we were talking about. So, you know, if you're wanting to start stuff more than, than two weeks early, you know, you can do the plastic. Plastic is good. But then when you take it off, you're still going to need to to keep that artificially warm somehow because it's still going to want to cool off. So if you do the sheet plastic, put the sheet plastic on, warm it up, take it off. And then when you plant, you would still then want to put either cloches over individual plants or a low tunnel up or a cold frame up or something. So for very early plantings, I would say your options are Put a low tunnel, a cold frame, or a cloche up until the soil is warm enough, and then plant. Um, and then put plastic over the soil until, or sorry, or you could put plastic over the soil until it's warm enough, and then remove the plastic, plant, and then put up a low tunnel, cold frame, or cloche. Um, and then how to speed up the soil warming. So uh, you could put the non-perforated plastic over low tunnel, and then switch after the soil is warm enough. So um, so like, like I said, the, you know, the perforated is, is much nicer because you don't need to vent it as much, but it, but it does stay a little cooler because it, it is venting. So you can, you know, just put the solid plastic over the low tunnel, um, plant stuff. And then when you start getting to warmer periods where you're going to start needing to vent, then switch it over to a perforated plastic or a row cover. You can also stack them. You could put plastic on the soil and then a low tunnel over the soil or a cold frame over the plastic or a cloche on top of the plastic. Um, and that's gonna speed the warming of that soil. And then when it's time to plant, take the plastic off, but don't take the other covering off. So there's there's different ways you can kind of stack these, kind of use them together, do different things. You could do a cloche inside a low tunnel to get it you know, even warmer. That's actually a pretty common thing in, um, 
in like commercial growers that want to that want to grow stuff throughout the winter, um, usually not cloches, but they'll do low tunnels inside like a high tunnel, basically like a greenhouse. Uh, they'll do both because that'll offer more protection than just one or the other. So measuring soil warmth, this probably should have been earlier because I keep talking about it. Um, but, you know, we keep talking about, you know, get the temperature at least this high or that high. So like, how, do, how the heck do you know how warm it is? Uh, the same way you know how warm pretty much anything is. You just use a thermometer. Uh, the best time to measure the soil temperature is mid to late morning. So first thing in the morning is when it's going to be like the absolute coldest. And if you wait to the afternoon, it's going to warm up um, and be much warmer than it's going to be, you know, 20 hours out of the day. So kind of mid to late morning is usually a good kind of average to find. There are special soil thermometers. So this is a picture of, of one that's a manual soil thermometer. Um, <clears throat> usually it's not just a glass thing because the glass, you know, as you're pushing it in, you could hit a rock or just a hard piece of dirt and it could break it and that's no fun. So they often are encased in metal or something that's not gonna shatter if you apply a lot of pressure to it. And you just push that into the soil. You usually wanna push it in about four inches and then you let it sit there for a while, you know, until the, until the thermometer stops moving um, and then see what the soil temperature is. You can use really any type of thermometer, like any kind of, you know, probe type thermometer, um, but using, most like most other thermometers that people have you know like for to check if you have a fever or for cooking or stuff like that don't go low enough like most of them are not going down to 32 degrees they're usually scaled to be much higher because that's you know if if your temperature is 32 you don't need to worry about having a fever um because you're dead. Um, and then like, you know, for cooking and stuff, you know, it's just not really a thing. Like usually we're cooking at much higher temperatures, but if you have another thermometer that goes um, cold enough, you can use any thermometer, but you can get a soil thermometer for, for pretty cheap. There is also, sometimes you can look up, um, I think it's extension, keeps like temperature data where you can look up like what's the soil temperature in such and such county. Uh, and that can be a good way to know kind of what, kind of where you're at ballpark wise, but that's not going to tell you, you know, if you cover your soil, what your exact temperature is going to be. So um, having a little thermometer can be a good, a good, pretty, pretty low cost investment to, um, to finding out uh, when, when you can plant stuff, hopefully nice and early. So then what to plant, we've, you know, we've talked about lots of things that we can plant, uh, but if you're just looking to start things earlier, uh, really any spring crop is a possibility. Anything that you would plant in the spring, you can plant early if you warm up the soil enough. But generally the easiest ones to do are gonna be the ones that are the hardiest to begin with. They're the ones that are the most forgiving. They're the ones that um, can grow in kind of the colder soil temperatures more happily. Um, so these would be things like spinach, turnip greens, arugula, peas, uh, lentils, garbanzo beans, potatoes. Um, onions. Onions are one that can be particularly beneficial because the earlier onions get planted, the larger the bulb potentially is because they will bulb at a certain time, um, no matter how big they are. So if the plant's real tiny, if you get to the date that they, that like the day length is the right thing to trigger them to produce a bulb, they're going to produce a bulb. And like, doesn't matter how big the plant is. So the earlier you can get them started, the bigger the plant is, um, usually the bigger the bulb you're going to get. Um, and then broccoli and cauliflower can also be good choices simply because they're hard to do in the spring because usually our spring isn't long enough. So getting those planted earlier can give you a higher success rate of actually getting a nice big head of broccoli or cauliflower if you're wanting to plant them in the spring. And then pairing these techniques with seedlings can give you an even earlier start. So, you know, planting broccoli, you know, two weeks early from a seedling is going to give you a much bigger head start than planting two weeks early from seed because um, the seedling itself is going to be probably four to six weeks old. So, you know, doing any of these things as seedlings uh, is going to give you even more of a jump. And this stuff, um, although it's not, you know, what you'd be doing right now, these same techniques can also be used for, for warm season crops. <clears throat> so, you can easily plant about two weeks earlier, uh, your warm season crops about two weeks earlier um, using these techniques. 
For your warm season crops, you need a minimum soil temperature of 60 degrees, but really you want between 65 and 70 to get like nice, healthy, robust growth. Um, temperatures lower than this means that they will essentially just not grow. Um, you know, if, if you plant a seedling, they're just going to sit there. If you plant seeds, they're just probably not going to germinate um, until the temperature gets high enough. And lower than this temperature literally prevents nutrient uptake in tomatoes. I see this all the time. People always want to get their tomatoes out as early as possible. And there's just almost no benefit to getting them out earlier than they want to go out. Because if the temperature is too cold, even if you dump fertilizer on them, they will be nutrient deficient because they can't absorb, and it's not all nutrients, but certain nutrients when the temperature is too cold. But if you do low tunnels, cold frame, things like that to warm up the space and plant them into that, you can get them out earlier and they're going to be happy and healthy and absorb nutrients. And so if you want to be getting especially your tomatoes out earlier, using some of these techniques can be really beneficial for you. Um, and it's really good for any warm season crop, but it's particularly helpful for um, things like tomatillos and ground cherries, which um, grow well here, but um, tend to tend to take a long time before they start producing. So again, getting them started earlier means you're going to get more harvest um, once they start producing because they'll start producing a couple weeks early. And then um, ginger and turmeric, which are two crops that really you can't get any meaningful harvest from unless you do some season extension. Um, and that's on both ends usually. So starting, you know, using a low tunnel or cold frame or something to get them started early is going to be helpful. And then also in the fall, covering them to let them grow another couple weeks. Um, once it starts getting cold in the fall, you're going to get like orders of magnitude bigger harvest than if you than if you don't do that. So those are, are ones that um, season extension for warm season crops can can really pay back the effort. So some other applications, um, you can also use these techniques to make um, naturally early crops even earlier. So like we talked about, like with perennials, for, you know, for example, like perennials are the easiest way to get an earlier crop, but you can actually force perennials. So, um, uh, so, so here we're talking about sea kale. So sea kale um, in Europe, which is where it's it's primarily grown, they cover them in these terracotta pots, which warm them up and make the shoots come up early. And then they actually, they mostly eat the shoots in Europe. Um, I like the little flower buds that taste like broccoli, but they like the shoots in Europe. But you could also do this for asparagus. What actually initiates asparagus, like sending up shoots from the ground is soil, is soil temperature. So if you warm up the soil where your asparagus is, it'll produce asparagus earlier. There's actually a farm in Wales that it's like, it's a huge farm, like hundreds, I think even potentially over a thousand acres um, that they're growing of, a, of just asparagus. And they've done all sorts of season manipulation things to keep the soil cooler or to make it warmer um, to get asparagus to produce for several months, like a much longer period than it normally would. And so if you have asparagus and you have, you know, two beds, let's say, of asparagus, because you really like asparagus, you could cover one with a low tunnel and leave the other one uncovered. And the one with the low tunnel is going to produce probably several weeks early. And then, um, and then the other one is going to start producing later and will continue to produce later. So you'll extend your asparagus specific harvest season by using these techniques. And you can do that with any with any perennial or any plant that's that's dormant. You can kind of use these techniques to to warm them up, and and they're usually going to start producing earlier. They're going to you know pop up earlier. And again, you can do that with low tunnels, cold frames, or cloches. Um, and yeah, anything that you would that you would plant earlier. So the things that we talked about, like oats or mosh or um, you know bread seed poppy, you know, any of those things, you can also use these techniques for those. You can put up a cold frame to warm it up to dry out the soil, which is a, a big problem to get things in earlier. You can put those up to dry out the soil so that you can plant oats even earlier or plant arugula even earlier. And you can also put them on things that you overwintered um, to get them growing earlier. So, so peas is one example of this. Um, where I, I really like pea shoots, like the greens of peas are really good when they're young. So if you plant a pea in the, in the fall, 
So the ones that we talked about, like Austrian winter pea or lynx pea or blaze pea, um, and you plant them, they'll grow, but they'll get about this big, and then they'll just kind of stay about that big all winter long. If you put a cold frame over them in like Feb like now in February, they're going to warm up and they're going to start growing. Whereas the peas that are not covered are not really going to start growing until March. So we actually did this at our demonstration garden a couple of years ago. And by, I think it was late March, the peas outside were this big and the ones inside the cold frame were like 14 inches tall, like just grew so much faster because because they were kept warm. So you can do those things too, to again, just kind of force things to wake up earlier, to start producing earlier, to grow earlier. So in summary, um, the easiest way to get an early harvest is to plant perennials. You can also harvest um, edible weeds or just, you know, forage edible wild things if you don't want to, if you don't like the idea of eating weeds. Um, also plant over wintering crops to get an earlier harvest next year. Um, and then you can put a heating structure over them in late winter to get them to start to kind of wake up and start producing earlier in the spring. You can plant crops that can be naturally planted earlier. So the things that we talked about like arugula, mosh, um, oats, bread seed poppy, flax. You can use heating structures to preheat the soil and create a warmer microclimate, which can potentially allow you to plant spring crops um, up to four to six weeks earlier than normal. And you can use those same structures to preheat soil, allowing you to plant warm season crops um, up to two weeks earlier. And then plant transplants in any of those situations to get an even bigger head start. Uh, and this picture over here is um, some sprouting broccoli that we overwintered. You can see this is um, a row cover, low tunnel. And this was in the spring. You can see how happy and healthy it looks after living through winter. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Dean. So I was able to get through 